The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our business continuity and the COVID-19 pandemic threat webinar. Um, I'm Sophie Sayer, the Sales Director and Joint Managing Executive at IT Governance Publishing. With me today is Business Continuity Consultant Robert Clark, who will be delivering the webinar today for us. Robert is the author of our best-selling book, Business Continuity and the Pandemic Threat, which has, uh, which was his uh, and has been his third publication. He is also a trainer and visiting university lecturer and has been awarded professional fellowships by both the British Computer Society and the Institute of Business Continuity Management. Robert has more than three decades of practical experience, having spent so much time uh, with IBM, Fujitsu and more recently PwC Malta. He has an MSc in Business Continuity, Security and Emergency Management from the Buckinghamshire New University. Robert will start with an overview of pandemic behaviour patterns and compare COVID-19 and seasonal flu. He will also provide us information about the key actions that can be taken at a global, national, corporate and individual level. He will then discuss the considerations uh, for a pandemic plan, such as working from home, supply chain management, crisis management roles and communications that need to be placed to ensure business continuity. Finally, he will provide guidance uh, on safety measures, healthy habits and protecting employees' health, as well as practical information on how to validate your pandemic plan. Before I hand over to Robert, I'll briefly explain the GRC International Group structure for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with it. So IT Governance Limited was a subsidiary of the group. It, uh, IT Governance is a cybersecurity and privacy risk management solutions provider. It develops and sells through its online shop a vast range of tools, software, training courses, e-learning and books to support GDPR compliance and reduce cybersecurity risks. IT Governance Publishing, which is where most of you will know me from, is another subsidiary uh, which seeks to deliver best practice technical and compliance expertise in multiple formats, such as books, toolkits and uh, bespoke publishing to a global audience. I'd also like to outline a few housekeeping rules, if that's OK with you all. You will be muted for the duration of the session but you can submit questions at, the t at any time using the questions function, which should uh, be the webinar control panel. Robert will address any questions at the end of the webinar. This presentation will be recorded and the slides in the recording will be emailed to you tomorrow. You can download a copy of the slides uh, from the handout section of the webinar control panel. So now it's time for me to hand you over to Robert by asking how he got involved with pandemics. Thank you, Sophie, and good afternoon to everyone. Well, I guess I've known about pandemics now for some time. Uh, people may well remember the swine flu outbreak in 2009 and the panic that accompanied the severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS for short, that was the first novel contagion of the new millennium. And in 2010, I think it was, I was facilitating some risk management workshops for the Ministry of Health in the Republic of Malta. For those of you not familiar with Malta's location, it's a group of five islands right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, about 100 kilometres to the south of Italy. Now, during those workshops, I noticed that when the subject of pandemic was raised, the attendees looked very concerned and they looked genuinely scared. When we'd finished the exercise, pandemic was not so much at the top of their list of risks, it was way out in front. And three or four years later, I guess, I was invited to design and deliver a two-day masterclass on the subject of business continuity and pandemics. They were to be run initially in Hong Kong and then in Dubai. Now, I know my business continuity, but I realised I would need to do some research on the subject of pandemics. I can tell you, the more research I did, the scarier the subject of pandemics seemed to become. 
Now, I actually ended up with far more material than I needed for the masterclass. And it was this point I concluded it would be a pity to waste all this research. So I wrote the book Business Continuity and the Pandemic Threat. I could easily talk about this subject for a couple of days, but we've only got less than an hour today. So on the last slide, I think it is, there are some useful references. Now, two of them refer to my own website, where the pandemic threat page, I have listed around 25 useful resources that may help you develop or refine your own pandemic response capability. Also on my website, there is a blog page, which has a, a number of very relevant articles, including a pandemic plan validation exercise case study, which has been very well received in the business world. Okay, so what is a pandemic? The World Health Organization tells us a pandemic is the worldwide spread of a disease for which there are no vaccines, no known cures, and for which people have no immunity. While there are exceptions, viruses have caused past pandemics typically have originated from animals, and they're referred to as zoonotic. Some pandemics aren't necessarily fatal to humans, and I guess a point in case is Zika even though it can tragically cause microcephaly in an unborn child. But historically, most common causes of pandemics have been influenza. Although through the last 75 years, almost 400 new infectious diseases have been discovered. In fact, since 1971, scientists have discovered 25 new pathogens for which we have no vaccines or no treatments, although most have not developed into a pandemic. One exception is certainly HIV AIDS, which was identified around 1980, and it's killed almost 40 million people in the four decades since its discovery. And around the same number are still infected with the disease. Another, of course, is COVID-19, where health services can only treat the patient's symptoms, as again, there's currently no vaccine available or no known cure. But obviously the world is working on that with, uh, with vigor. But I'll talk more about COVID-19 in a later slide. A colleague uh, recently suggested that the time was possibly approaching when we could consider starting a review of the lessons we could learn regarding the damage that COVID-19 has caused. He was considering not obviously the, just the human cost, but the disruption to the global, uh, global economy and business communities as well. Now, despite his expression of positivity, unfortunately, a potentially discouraging word of caution is perhaps more fitting. We need to be circumspect, I believe, in allowing ourselves to be lured into what may be a premature false sense of optimism. We need to look only at Japan, which was initially commended for its efficient management of the virus. Now, 26 days after it ended its state of emergency, a new one has been imposed as it faces up to the prospect of a second wave. Concerns have been expressed that its health service could collapse if the virus keeps spreading. Singapore, I, I read this morning, after appearing to manage the situation reasonably well, is another country appearing to be heading into a second wave. The reality is that there's still a lot more we need to learn about this virus. This includes whether or not patients surviving COVID-19 will have developed any immunity against future infection. At the moment, it seems the jury is very much out on that point. History tells us that pandemics can last for as much as two years and they can come in waves. So if COVID-19 follows that pattern, we must remember that we are currently riding only the first wave, certainly here in the UK. Last Friday, uh, a Dr. Barrett Pankhanier, I think you pronounce his name, from Exeter University, gave a very good interview to the BBC, and he was even talking about a fourth wave. Now, as you can see from the slide, the second wave of the 1918-1919 Spanish flu inf influenza outbreak was far worse than the first, as was the third. So we must be prepared to plan for the worst while naturally we continue hoping for the best. As part of the research I did for the masterclass I mentioned earlier, uh, as well as for my book, I visited Hong Kong, Singapore and Vietnam. They were three of the six global SARS hotspots, the others being Beijing, Toronto and Taiwan. I spoke to a variety of people and the one thing they all had in common was a sense of fear that they associated with SARS, even though compared with COVID-19, SARS was really just a sideshow. 
I later came across John Barry's quotation, which you see on the slide. And although it's in reference to the Spanish flu, it could equally apply to just about any pandemic. There is the prospect of major panic as more and more people are infected by COVID-19. There's already talk about the expectation of post-traumatic stress disorder or P PTSD developing amongst frontline health workers, paramedics, care home workers, food store employees, anyone who's at the front line on this, putting their, their, um, their lives at risk every day. These are the people we need certainly to thank for, uh, for their efforts. We mustn't forget the stress that people will be experiencing who are following government lockdown instructions and staying at home for most, if not all the time. Here in the UK, the, the lockdown has certainly been far less draconian than the measures applied in other countries. We've seen panic buying of foods such as rice, pasta and flour. Soaps and hand sanitizers have flown off the shelves. And quite frankly, what the nation is going to do with that monumental quantity of toilet paper that's disappeared from supermarkets, I really do not know. As for public disorder, maybe we have that to look forward to. I'd like to take a minute or two comparing some of the contagions that have caused us grief over the last century. We've tended to think of pandemics as being primarily caused by influenza viruses. But as you'll note from the first three in this table, they are actually coronaviruses, hence the COV identifier in the first column. Top of the list is SARS which was described as an economic tsunami. And yet, as you can see, less than 10,000 cases were identified and its mortality rate of 9.5% meant less than 1,000 people died. Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS for short. You may not be familiar with it, it's sometimes called camel cough. And while it does not spread from human to human, well, quite as easily as SARS anyway, it does have a much higher mortality rate. Again, SARS and uh, MERS do not have any vaccines or known cures at this point in time. Then we come to COVID-19. Last week, we passed the 2 million mark for confirmed cases with fatalities close on 150,000. It spreads indiscriminately across the population. And this is, of course, the here and now of the pandemic story. The fourth example is seasonal flu, which annually kills around half a million people globally as many as 50 million people can be affected by it. But strangely enough, no one seems to panic about that quite as much as the other uh, contagions. And finally, there is the infamous Spanish flu. Now there are various theories, but no one really knows for sure where it originated. But I can tell you, it was not Spain. Just like the Dutch had nothing to do with the so-called Dutch arms disease. Now with Spanish flu, a conservative estimate is that around 50 million people died. And some scholars actually think that it brought World War I to an earlier end than otherwise would have happened. So why weren't we warned? Good question. Well, actually, we were. First in 2002, 2003, the SARS outbreak should have acted as a warning. Then in 2015, Bill Gates, who's very much committed to um, resolving epidemics and pandemics, he provided another wake up call with a talk entitled, The Next Outbreak, We're Not Ready. In 2016, I published my book, Business Continuity and the Pandemic Threat, which I hope might also act as a reminder as to what was likely coming downstream. I think it would be true to say that initially, at least, it received a mixed reception. Moreover, many national risk registers, and I've seen quite a few, uh, they've put the threat of a severe pandemic at the top of their agendas. The 2017 version of the UK's National Risk Register of Civil Emergencies, which is in the public domain if you want to have a look, it flags a pandemic as a major threat to the security of the nation. It recalls the probability of a severe pandemic occurring within the next five years as being between one in 20 and one in five. It also registers a corresponding impact as catastrophic. Now, here we are less than three years after that warning was published and we're facing COVID-19. Now, despite the writing on the wall, there are a plethora of unregulated organisations out there that have opted to wait and prepare a pandemic plan only when they're warned that one is imminent. So I'd, I'd like you all just to consider this. 
On February the 1st, there were around 14 and a half thousand known coronavirus global cases. And at that point, around 300 people had died. A month later, those numbers had increased to 88,000 and 3,000 respectively. Within two months, the count was 1 million cases with 50,000 fatalities. As of an hour ago, confirmed cases were around 2.5 million, and the death count is now well over 170,000. So here's the question. Had your organization been one of those unprepared for a pandemic, at what point would you have hit the panic button? Now look, we, we live in a very interconnected world, and the reality is that we may not get much warning at all. Modern commercial aviation can facilitate a contagion's proliferation across the world in a matter of hours. And due to a Chinese government cover-up, SARS was spreading in 2002, 2003, even before the World Health Organization knew of its existence. I guess it's also worth noting that adding at this time, the WHO, it's often referred to, is constantly monitoring contagions. It looks to provide as much warning as possible when contagions have the capability of developing into pandemics. But as China initially kept quiet about SARS, any chance of an early warning was lost. So SARS broke out of China. It took a one night stopover in Hong Kong before traveling on to Ontario, I beg your pardon, Toronto, Taiwan, Singapore, and Vietnam, ultimately reaching 26 countries. I mentioned initially that my book got a mixed reception. The medical fraternity welcomed it with enthusiasm, and to my knowledge, at least two doctors have referenced my book in their own publications. Conversely, the business continuity community, who I've had very much in mind when I wrote the book, well, I don't think I'm exaggerating the case when I say they played it rather cool. Some told me it was too morbid for their tastes. So I ask you, how can you make a cheerful book about a life-threatening pandemic? It's a morbid and scary subject, I'm afraid. Others actually laughed at me, and they told me I'd wasted my time as it really wasn't going to happen. It was pointed out to me that it was 100 years ago that the Spanish flu had done its worst, and there hadn't been a serious pandemic since. Obviously, the medical profession was now on top of things. I genuinely feel for everyone working in health services around the world, because that last statement is so far from the truth. You've probably spotted that every day the media is bombarding us with information about the pandemic. And there are a number of stories out there which, uh, shall we say, are of dubious origin. After 9-11 terrorist attack and the 7-7 terrorist attack upon London, a number of conspiracy theories followed. Now, just like 9-11 and 7-7, there are also a number of cons conspiracy theories already circulating about the COVID-19 virus. For example, it was caused by the 5G communication revolution, and COVID-19 was manufactured in a laboratory in China. And if there's any of you located in the Greater Manchester area out there, there really isn't a shortage of type zero negative blood. Now, because each country is approaching the management of the crisis in its own way, my advice to you is to rely on your government and your health service bulletins. In the UK, I would also recommend the BBC as a reliable source too. Do not, please do not believe what you read on social media unless you are able to verify the actual source of the information. Now this slide's got some sample data relating to confirmed case, uh, case fatalities and recovered patients by country. Uh, this was taken earlier today. I think you will agree it does not make for pretty reading. Last week, Bill Gates was interviewed by the BBC, and he was asked, what did he think about the state of readiness that countries were now demonstrating? All he would say is that not many countries would get an A grade. What we're witnessing is every country approaching the current crisis in their own way. Most seem to be following a similar, if not identical path, although there are, of course, exceptions. If you take Belarus president, I think his name is pronounced Alexander Lukashenko, he seems to be in denial. 
He refuses to consider any form of lockdown. And would you believe he maintains that drinking vodka and taking saunas will ward off the evil virus? He was also seen taking part in an ice hockey game a week or so ago. Now, meanwhile, Brazil's president announced that the coronavirus is just hysteria. And he then went ahead and fired his health minister. There are others I can think of in very prominent positions who have downplayed the seriousness of the situation while keeping uh, on changing their rhetoric. Unfortunately, these individuals seem to be few and far between. But I really want to talk about Hong Kong. I've been a frequent visitor to Hong Kong over the years, and I've always been very impressed with its state of readiness as it patiently waited for the next pandemic. It has a population of around about seven and a half million crammed into one of the top five most densely populated parts of the world. Any contagious disease getting into that population could really wreak havoc. SARS really devastated Hong Kong economically, and there were far more fatalities, almost 300, than there have been so far with COVID-19. As of last Friday, there had been four. What's more, the number of diagnosed SARS cases is almost double that of COVID-19. And I just hope I'm not tempting Providence by quoting these numbers while the pandemic is still ongoing. But approximately 22% of all SARS cases in Hong Kong were health workers who simply did not know what they were dealing with because of the Chinese government cover-up. It's a bit like the old Soviet Union in 1986, I think it was, hoping that the world wouldn't notice the Chernobyl nuclear plant had blown up. Well, surprise, surprise, the world did notice, and both the Soviet Union and China were both caught holding smoking guns. So SARS really acted as a massive wake-up call, and ever since then, Hong Kong has remained on a constant state of alert, ready for the next contagion to kick off. As passengers arrive, those of you not being there, you're discreetly scanned, uh, scanned by uh, thermal imaging cameras, and anyone displaying a temperature would be invited to step to one side where medical staff would be waiting. Some countries have already started using various forms of thermal Im imaging since COVID-19 outbreak started, but certainly not all. Hong Kong has been doing this since the SARS crisis. You're usually handed fact sheets in Hong Kong about any contagions that the Health Protection Department are particularly concerned about. Over a period of several years, I've been given fact sheets about SARS, like the one in the, um, in the slide, um, Ebola, Dengue, avian flu, and the health department's website has got an abundance of fact sheets relating to other contagions as well. The escalator uh, in the picture, that's located in one of Hong Kong's mass transit railway stations. The system is one of the most efficient I've come across, and normally it would carry, I guess, around 5 million passengers every day. Now, the escalator's got a sticker on it, which you may not be able to read, but it says, antibacterial coating applied to the handrail with disinfection. This is done daily. And the trains are also routinely sprayed with antibacterial and disinfectant sprays. Again, this is done even if there's not a pandemic raging. Likewise, if you go into the Central Library in Causeway Bay, you'll see electronic signboards with warnings about contagions written in both English and Chinese. Notices inform visitors that the lift, or if you prefer, the elevator call buttons, are sanitised several times a day. Go into any of the big shopping malls, and you will come across dispensers with hand dispensing uh, sanitising gel, just like the ones you find in hospitals. The hotel that I regularly stay in proactively practices cross-training of staff so that most people can do several jobs in addition to their own. Even the manager of the housekeeping staff will be seen occasionally making up rooms just to keep his hand in. On one occasion I asked him if this was in preparation for the next pandemic and he said, yes sir, it is. On my first visit to Hong Kong, I remember noticing a number of people wearing surgical face masks in public. My initial thought, I guess, was that perhaps they were trying to avoid catching something or maybe it was something to do with air pollution. I was wrong on both counts. Even though there was no pandemic raging, this was them saying, I am not well and I don't want to pass it on to anyone else. Now, just how public spirited is that? It's only now that we've got a pandemic on our hands that people in other countries are being encouraged to wear masks if they are infectious. And I would hope that's before they're reminded that they shouldn't be out anyway. This slide shows a map of Hong Kong and the new territories. 
along with every case of diagnosed COVID-19. This is in the public domain. The green dots show cases that were diagnosed more than 14 days ago, while the red dots are showing cases diagnosed within the last fortnight. On the left-hand side, you'll see the case history summary, whereas on the right-hand side, you have a list of every patient with their case number, sex, age, residential status, where it was believed they were infected, you know, Hong Kong or overseas, and their current status. Are they hospitalized? Have they been discharged? Or even are they dead? But unfortunately, there's only four of those. And in the interest of patient confidentiality, the only thing it does not tell you is their name. You can also click on any of the green or red dots on the map, and a drop down menu will provide similar details plus the actual address of the building they were living in, bearing in mind that the majority of buildings in Hong Kong are high rise. If the patient was admitted to hospital, it tells you which hospital they're being treated in. So, in my humble opinion, if anywhere deserves that elusive A grade that Bill Gates mentioned, it's got to be Hong Kong. So let's talk about your pandemic plan. Is it too late to put a plan together now we're in the middle of a pandemic? Well, to be perfectly honest, it's eminently more preferable to have a plan in place before a pandemic kicks off. But the short answer is no, it's not too late, especially as this pandemic is likely to have two or more waves. In fact, over the course of the last weekend, I listened to various eminent clinicians and scientists being interviewed by the BBC, and some were suggesting there could even be a fourth, a fifth, and maybe even a sixth pandemic wave. Yes, I know, not exactly cheerful news, is it? But the reality is we won't know how many waves are going to be until the pandemic is over and we can look back with the benefit of hindsight. Now, while we cannot stop a pandemic from occurring, we can take steps to mitigate the impact while helping to better protect employees and visitors to the workplace. So how should we approach the planning process and what should be in the plan? Now, if you look at the Business Continuity Institute's Good Practice Guidelines, those of you that are familiar with it, it suggests in some situations creating contingency plans is appropriate for tackling specific threats or risks. And it actually cites pandemic plan as an example. OK, so, you know, that's that sounds like a good start. It then rather states the obvious by suggesting that working remotely from the normal workplace, which one assumes means working from home, it has benefits of isolation during a pandemic. And this would reduce your chances of being infected. But that's it. That's all the help you get from the BCI's good practice guidelines. So where do we go from here? Now, I've heard some people argue that there's really not a lot of point being gained in performing a risk assessment at this stage. It's probably not going to tell you anything you don't already know. There's a pandemic knocking at our door. We all know that. And I'm afraid I don't entirely agree with that school of thought. To begin with, if you expect to continue working from your normal workplace, it would be sensible to perform a risk assessment on what I will later talk about and call infection traps. I would also suggest that you take note of what the UK National Cyber Security Centre has to say about malicious cyber actors exploiting COVID-19. You'll find the link on my website and the URL um, is on that, uh, that slide I mentioned at the back of the, uh, the pack. Apart from the human aspect of this pandemic, which I'll talk about in a moment, I would also strongly recommend that you look closely at your supply chain, both upstream and downstream. Even before the WHO had declared a pandemic, Jaguar Land Rover was one of the companies that declared it was having supply chain problems because it was dependent upon China for components and China had effectively closed down. Another particular example, which is in the news just about every day now, is personal protection equipment. This affects just about every country in the world, as the availability of PPE is essential for both health workers, not to mention nursing home and um, care home staff. You know, the list goes on. Uh, there was an article on the, uh, the television this morning about dentists also needing uh, PPE, which of course makes sense. The reality is the world is not manu manufacturing it fast enough and there is just not enough PPE to go around. Had this pandemic been influenza rather than COVID-19, then the likelihood is the demand for PPE would have been far less. That's no consolation, I appreciate. But what about your clients? They will want to know if you're still operating. So it might be sensible to create a revised landing page on your website 
that keeps them informed of what's happening. Are you still fully operational? What services and products can they expect from you and so on? Might I suggest you, you take a look at the Amazon website, which has included an option button called COVID-19 Delivery, Returns and Safety. Now, if you click on that link, it will present you with a useful set of frequently asked questions. And this may be the same sort of thing that you need to, to consider yourself. If your organization has already embraced business continuity, then you already know what your critical products, services and processes are. You'll also know how long your organization can survive without them, which in turn will help you define your recovery time objectives. You also establish which IT systems are critical, so you can prioritize their recovery should the needs ever arise to actually recover them. You will also know if IT can support the operation remotely or whether a presence in the workplace is required. Remotely supporting your IT uh, may be facing technical constraints, or perhaps it could be other factors such as security issues that demands their presence in the workplace. A business impact analysis exercise will have helped you establish which people are in key positions and who, if anyone, can replace them if they're not available. Please never ever assume that your entire workforce will always be available to help support your recovery from a serious crisis, especially not from a pandemic. You are going to see long term absentees. I'm, I'm afraid that is a, is a given. You might find it helpful if you had a skill profile for every member of your staff, including senior management. That would help you define your backfilling and cross-training options and strategies. I once had to persuade a senior manager to do the same for COBOL programming. He was the only person in the entire organization with any knowledge, albeit from the distant past, of some legacy systems. Although he'd never publicly admit it, I actually think he rather enjoyed getting his hands dirty again. But if I hadn't known that he was the guy to go to, we would have had a serious problem. Now, I also realise that this could be a sensitive issue. Well, it certainly is in the UK anyway. I remember that if I was interviewing a woman for a position, the law actually forbade me from asking if she had children, as that would be seen to possibly putting her at a disadvantage to any male applicants for the same position. So I appreciate that one's a tricky one. But if you do know that someone has children, then you may realize that they may have to take time off to look after children if they're sick or if schools close. I would also recommend that you look at everyone in the organization who is potentially more vulnerable. Um, what's the best way of describing it? Yeah, more vulnerable to the, the contagion because of an existing health uh, condition. On this point, I would encourage that you see what practical support you can offer them to help mitigate the risk. And if you can allow them to work at home, then that's a sensible option to, uh, to follow. If you have not got a comprehensive succession plan in place, then I would urge you to address this with some urgency. As I mentioned before, this virus is indiscriminate and anyone from the most junior to the most senior members of staff are all vulnerable. But, and this is a very important but, do not just consider the C-suite or whatever you call your organization's top management. Consider the entire organization, as there may be employees in comparatively junior positions who are the only ones who know how to do their jobs, and it could be a key job. For example, your payroll clerk may be the only person who knows how the payroll system works. Should you find that you have any single points of failure, if a particular person or persons are taken ill, it's better to know it before the event than after. At least, you stand a chance of, of managing um, some sort of contingency uh, plan. If any or even all of your employees can work from home without compromising anything like security or regulations or client contractual obligations, then this should be positively encouraged. Now look, I, I know there are some organizations out there where managers like to see their employees hard at work in the office, but these are exceptional times. If they can work from home, then for goodness sake, please let them. But make sure you set up and maintain some form of regular communication with all members of staff. Now, with online platforms like Skype and Zoom and so on, and the one we're using today, virtual meetings have been they've become fairly easy, and people are less likely to feel they've been forgotten by their employer. 
So at the very least, consider something like regular team meetings. If you need some or even all of your employees to be physically in the workplace, you've got a duty of care for them and you must ensure that social distancing is practiced. And um, we've all heard about social distancing over the last uh, few weeks and that's not going to stop, I don't think. So let's talk about working from home. I appreciate if your job involves tasks like operating heavy machinery, driving articulated lorries, working in a warehouse, or perhaps you're a member of the emergency services, likely as not, you are, will not be able to work from home. But of course, the list will be quite more extensive than that. That said, there are those fortunate people who only need an internet connection to be able to work from home. I count myself amongst that ever-growing band of what's now commonly referred to as digital nomads. Some people, I think, tend to think that the advent of smart technology really facilitated this revolution, uh, being able to work from home. Well, it wasn't. I personally started working from home about 25 years ago. And even then, I consider myself to be a relative latecomer to the scene. It was actually some 36 years ago that a guy called Jeff Grady, one of the senior operations analysts in my team at IBM UK, was nominated to pioneer the concept of working from home. Now, the internet was barely out of nappies or diapers, if you prefer, and the mainframe still dominated the information technology world. Now, he was regularly on call outside normal business hours, and this meant avoiding a 25 mile or 40 kilometer round trip when he was called out, especially in the middle of the night. But when he was needed, the link between Jeff's terminal and the mainframe was always activated, and when he'd finished, deactivated from the data center. But how things have changed, how they've evolved since those early days of home working. Today, in principle, if you spend much of your time attached to a computer or a smart device, then it's entirely possible you could work from home, as many national governments are now encouraging their citizens to do. Now, I know some organizations have already made provision for staff working from home by providing appropriate IT equipment, in addition to validating that it functions correctly in the home location. Don't forget that, that's quite important. There's no point setting up someone to work from home if you don't know it's going to work. Um, I guess this could be a similar arrangement to the one I've just described that we had at IBM back in 1984, or it could even be part of what we'd call a work area recovery plan, perhaps to develop a, a denial of access um, threat scenario if you've lost your, your premises through fire, flooding, or whatever the, the scenario happens to be. Alternatively, there are others who may choose to adopt the bring your own device concept, BYOD, as some see it as a, a cost-saving panacea. But they should remember that BYOD does have its pros and cons. And while it can offer a relatively quick and inexpensive solution, it is also capable of creating serious longer-term issues. Consequently, if it's mismanaged, it could stand for bring your own disaster rather than bring your own device. So please, please treat that cautiously if that's the way you're going. And personally, as I say, I've been home based since 1995. Um, so having to work from home because of COVID-19 is just business as usual for me. The big difference is liaising with clients and the occasional training courses I do, and of course today's webinar, they're no longer classroom based or client site based, they're all online. However, if homeworking is new to you, it can be a challenge. So here's just three suggestions I'd like to make, which could make it easier for you. Firstly, assuming you don't live on your own, if you can ideally work in a room where you can shut the door and keep clear of whatever else is happening at home, that'd be so much better. That could even be a garden shed, if it has everything you need, such as a table, heat, power, internet, and so on. I'll be honest, if it's a nice day, I sometimes sit in the garden and work there. I do appreciate that you can have small demanding children who want to help mummy or daddy. That can be a bit of a distraction, but that you're gonna to have to manage. The second point is I manage my time using the Pomodoro technique. Now, yes, I know Pomodoro is Italian for tomato, but don't let that fool you. This is an app that I use on my laptop and it lets me decide how long I want to work before I take a break and then how long the breaks are. So I usually opt for a 25 minute slot and take a short break of around five minutes. You can find this app, it's free. You can Google it and download it. 
look for Pomodoro technique. During the break I take, I might make a coffee, do some exercises, perhaps sit in the garden for a few minutes, it's a nice day, and so on. I break for lunch, and ideally, if I can, I'll take a walk. This all helps me to keep my mind fresh throughout the day, but you need to find out what works for you. This is me just telling you what works for me. The final thing that I do that I would suggest is I often listen to quiet, and I emphasize the word quiet, background music, although I try and avoid anything with any singing as I find that can be distracting. Heaven forbid, I might start singing along as well. My choice would used to be classical adagio, such as Pachelbel's Canon, J.S. Bach's Air on a G-String, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, and so on. I find this incredibly relaxing and therapeutic. So if the concert appeals to you, then listen to whatever floats your boat, just as long as it's not a distraction. And it's also worth adding that there are occasions when there can be distracting noises coming from outside the house that you've got no contract, uh, no um, contract, I'm saying, you've got no control over. Um, men digging up the road, for example, if there's uh, a water leak or a gas leak, perhaps a, a neighbour fixing his shed roof with a large hammer or someone cutting their grass with a noisy lawnmower. All I would say is on that subject is headphones are a wonderful thing. Potential dangers in the workplace. Some organisations have had no option but to close down due to the mandatory lockdowns, while others have been able to continue working remotely from their premises. However, if your organisation is still operating in its usual workplace, this slide is very much for you. I do like the expression corporate cleanliness, although I equally appreciate that the word corporate implies a large company or group of companies. However, in this context, corporate cleanliness is intended to be inclusive of all organisations, large or small, public sector, private sector, it doesn't really matter. I will talk about the importance of washing hands and social distancing a little more uh, in, in a later slide. But for now, I just wanted to, <coughs> excuse me, I just wanted to look at keeping the working environment as safe as possible for employees and visitors. So I'll start with what I call infection traps. This can be quite extensive and will invariably differ from organization to organization. Things that, such as door handles, tabletops, work services, uh, stair rails, food, beverage, vending machines, kitchen equipment, light switches, toilet seats, machinery with um, control buttons, levers, switches, and so on, pool cars, uh, vans, lorries, things like this, um, even to the point of, of things like telephones, including dining pads, computer mice, keyboards, and so on. Um, What is equally imperative is that you, if you outsource the cleaning of your premises, you ensure the vendor can demonstrate that their staff are fully trained in pandemic cleaning protocols, including deep cleaning if necessary. They also need to be using the appropriate cleaning agents. Alternatively, if cleaning an in house as an in house activity, you will need to ensure that your cleaning staff are fully trained, along with any replacement staff. Don't forget, these people can become ill or decide they don't want to do it anymore just as much as anyone else. Testing. Whether you call it testing, exercising, training, rehearsing, what you need to be sure about is that your plan will work, that it's fit for purpose. Okay. Um, how are you going to do it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the business continuity good practice guidelines wasn't a lot of help in what should be in your plan. When it comes to testing, uh, there are about 28 pages, 30 pages, something like that. And the way you would test your business continuity plan is more or less the same as you would test your pandemic plan. So it is worth looking through that. I'm, I'm not going to have time today to go through step by step. But you can start off with just using uh, a, a desktop walkthrough, maybe two or three people. You can progress to a workshop. If you're going to be using online platforms for your meetings make sure that everyone knows how to use it i've actually been on online meetings with clients recently that have been disrupted because not everyone who was supposed to join the meeting knew how to use the technology for goodness sake so all this can be followed up with the workshops that involves senior management or crisis management team i, I would prefer to call them here i'm going to recommend that you go to my blog and read the article on pandemic validation exercise case study you can see the URL is actually on this slide. 
This is the study about crisis management team exercise that I facilitated. I am told it's just about as close to reality as it can get. And I have read a lot of positive feedback about it. The exercise is using random selection methods to establish who in the organization was infected. Even senior managers are falling ill to see how the crisis management team could cope with its numbers being decimated. It has a simulated duration of 12 weeks. And at one point, it became so realistic that two of the senior managers almost came to blows. So a little bit of advice, when you're exercising your organization's plan, do remember it can sometimes become stressful for the participants. Some people think that the expression social distancing has just been invented. And that includes a White House spokesman last weekend who said, we've never had to do this before. Well, that's not strictly true because at least 100 years ago, social distancing was being practiced during the Spanish flu. Um, the important thing is it can save lives. So please follow any social distancing instructions, whether you're in the workplace or whether you're outside somewhere. Now, we're getting lots of advice from health services around the world telling everyone washing your hands is the best way to defeat the virus. No one ever tells us why that's so important. But having seen people before the, uh, the lockdown occurred in the UK, going into motorway service station, public uh, washrooms, and then leaving without washing their hands, there are obviously some people that feel it doesn't mean them. So for those individuals who fall into the why bother category, I'm just gonna read something from a, a simple explanation from a critical care nurse in the UK. She says, the outer wall of a virus is made up of lipids and they're very like oil or fat. And not surprisingly, it's called the lipid layer. Behind the lipid is the virus, which is made up of proteins and RNA, which is rather like a DNA, and it's what lets the virus replicate. Soap is also made up of loads and loads of lipids, and it's what makes soap feel so soft and smooth. So when you wash your hands really well, you get rid of all those lipids on your hands. So if you have COVID-19 on your hands, the lipids in the soap will break down the lipids in the virus and the virus itself will be destroyed. Simple as that. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I just want to summarize, keep washing your hands, practicing social distance, and above all else, please stay safe. Sophie, back to you. Oh, before Sophie joins yeah. us, this is the- um, Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, just to say, Sophie, these are the references that um, people may find useful. So, Sophie, perfect. Thank you, Bob. That was that was excellent. Um, we've worked together for a, lo a lot of years at ITGP, so it was really nice to kind of get get some theory behind behind the, the types of things we publish on. So, thank you for that. Um, in a moment, everybody, um, Robert's going to take your questions. Uh, please submit them using the questions function uh, of the webinar control panel if you haven't done so already. Um, before we take the questions, uh, and I just wanted to let you know about the Coronavirus Business Continuity Management Bundle, um, specifically developed for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and it does include Robert's book, as well as useful guidance, templates and risk assessments to help you develop a business continuity plan. So make sure you give that a look. Um, yeah, IT Governance has a number of other products and services actually to help you during these challenging times, uh, such as the remote, remote working a policy template kit, remote access penetration testing and the ISO 22301 BCMS toolkit. Okay, so Bob, are you ready to take some questions? I am Sophie, yes. Perfect. So. Um... I'll hand over to you and then uh, before we wrap up at the end. The first one is actually about URLs. So I'm just going to go back a couple of slides, if I may. Um, there we are. The first group of URLs at the top there are uh, a list of resources in the pandemic threat uh, page. And the one below that is a blog, which you'll find, among other things, the pandemic validation exercise that uh, I was talking about a moment ago. OK. Um, another question I've got here. 
what effect do you think the pandemic will have on the global economy? Oh, that's a good one. Well, one forecast that I recall seeing, now this must have been about 10 years ago, was that it was likely to cost the global economy something like 3.2 trillion US dollars. And that was 10 years ago. And at the moment, we've really no idea. I mean, countries are spending money uh, for various um, initiatives that they're, uh, they're sponsoring. How much of that is, is going to cost in the long run? I have no idea. But we already know that China's economy has shrunk for the first time in three decades, more than three decades, in fact. And this morning, I read that US oil producers are virtually giving oil away because the bottom has fallen out of the market. OK. Another question we have here. Which industries do you think will suffer the most in the pandemic? Um, the obvious ones, I guess, are tourism, hospitality, events. I love my football. I love my cricket. None of that's happening at the minute. Um, retail, except, of course, food stores and, and pharmacies have been very much affected. Um, but there are those retail outlets that have got online presences that I believe will possibly fare better. OK, we've got a couple more coming up there. Just trying to see. Uh, bear with me one second. Can't quite read this one. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, here we go. Oh. Do you see any prospect? Sorry, do you see any positives coming out of, of this current um, crisis? Well, um, I guess those companies that can actually react to an opportunity that they see will benefit. Um, for example, UK company Burberry has been in the news the last couple of days. It has started making personal protection equipment for the health service, and there are others that are doing that. Uh, in, in fact, a friend of mine was telling me the other day, he's only got a small company, uh, employees five people, I think, but he's got 3D printers and he started making surgical visors for the National Health Service. So it's, it's like a little cottage industry. And if lots of smaller organizations that have the resources um, can actually change direction in terms of what their product set is, then maybe there are opportunities there for them to um, actually take advantage of. Um, I'm also afraid we're seeing a rise in the number of scammers trying to exploit the situation to their own ends. Uh, I remember what I said earlier on about um, cyber um, uh, threats, etc. That, that's very much one of them, but there are others. And um, it was reported this morning that over a thousand have been apprehended in the UK alone just in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I guess also you need to look out for Dr. John's miracle cures, big chief running waters, very best snake oil. Look, the, the reality is at this point, there is no known cures, no vaccines available. So please don't fall for any of these scams. Um, there's one other thing that I, I didn't mention in the webinar. It's probably worth um, keeping, up, uh, keeping in mind is on the World uh, Health Organization's website, there is a page devoted to myths. So you will not, I don't think, find that drinking vodka and taking saunas is one way to avoid the, the pandemic, which was the, um, the president of um, Belarus's solution to this. But there are lots of others that people think, well, that, that might help. Garlic. If I eat lots of garlic, will that save me from the virus? Well, the honest answer is no one knows. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So, yeah, keep, keep that in mind. Now, what else do we have here? Bear with me while I just bring some down. Um, any concrete strategies or theories that you might suggest that can be followed to ensure a, sorry, just try and scroll down. There we are. Uh, to ensure a smooth recovery for going back to business as usual. Um, to some extent, I'm afraid that is going to be a little bit event driven. And um, this will change by country depending on what regulations each country puts into place we're still going to have social distancing i believe for some time to come 
we're seeing some countries, not the UK at this point in time, but, but Germany, Denmark, for example, um, they have announced a relaxing of their, um, their measures at the moment. So it would depend on exactly what business you are in and exactly what the government says you can and can't do as a nation as to how that's going to affect you. So I don't think I can really give you a, a specific answer. Um, but um, as I say, if you want to look in the blog afterwards, because any questions that we don't fully answer, then we will certainly try and put an answer in there to um, respond to that. That's another one I'm trying to read here. Um, right, here we are. Um, giving uncertainty of what relaxation, uh, re relaxation of lockdown restrictions will look like when leadership teams, sorry, keep scrolling too far. Um, when they happen, what actions should leadership teams be considering when looking at a potential return to business? Similar to the last one. Um, what I'm seeing in the press is speculation sometimes. Uh, and there was one the other day in the UK that all the schools are going back uh, in the first week in May. There's no truth in that. So the best thing I can suggest to you, as I mentioned before, rely on your government or your health service for um, reliable information. And I'm afraid as far as that's concerned, you'll have to, in, in fact, what I'm, I'm thinking about is I, I will endeavour to put together a blog in the next few days that are covering these points and post that on the IT governance um, publishing website. So please go and look for that and see what um, what is there can help you. If you've got any questions, then I'm contactable and happy to um, respond to anything but, uh, within reason. Okay, um, that seems to be it, Sophie. Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Um, that was brilliant. Nice, um, nice little flurry of questions at the end there. So thank you uh, for those. So yeah, um, you know, I would absolutely recommend the the book. And I know um, Robert has put it on the slide here, the link to the IT Governance Publishing website, uh, the, the pandemic book. So I know it's definitely helped me a lot in the um, in the kind of transformation of working from home, uh, especially with a, a young family. So absolutely recommend that book. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of does bring us to the end of the webinar. Um, I hope you've all found it really informative. Thank you to all of our attendees today. Um, and just as a reminder, you'll receive a copy of the slides and the webinar recording by email tomorrow from, from the IT governance team. Um, so yeah, thank you, Robert. And thank you everybody for attending. Have a good afternoon and stay safe. Goodbye.